Hey, welcome back to another one of my informative videos. This one's going to be on understanding rod ratios. Uh, this particular little screen right here is just kind of a generic article from Engine Builder Magazine, July of 2016. But uh, they got some interesting stuff, and they're actually pretty, pretty technical about it. Anyway, what I want to talk about uh, is you know rod ratio, and uh, you know what got me thinking about rod ratio is you know I've been doing a lot of work with that Hoover mod stuff. And of course, when you read Hoover, Hoover's also spewing some stuff about rod ratios. So we need to figure out not just what a rod ratio really is, because I'm going to actually do the math, because, well, you know, hey, it's what I do. I do math. That's the difference between me and what uh, you typically get with other people that are doing stuff. Like, for instance, this particular article right there that I'm looking at. Uh, they've got no diagrams, so we're going to look at some actual diagrams. But let's take a look at the forums. I'd love to go to the forums. Let's hit up, let's say, the Samba. So over here at the Samba, we've got somebody who says right here in the gray, Sir Henry Ricardo figured it all out in 1930, 1940. It's called the Ricardo Rule. Track it down and see for yourself. Don't take my word for it. This guy continues on. Based on the recommendations of Bob Hoover, you need to get longer rods. If your crank is longer than 74, or you will see high piston and cylinder wear and be building an engine with a lot of internal friction. So where did this come from? Well, that comes from things like this. According to the Ricardo rule, the maximum crank stroke should be approximately 73.8. So that's where it comes from. So we've got a guy who's quoting Hoover, and Hoover appears to be quoting Ricardo. So continuing on in that same conversation, we've got this guy right there who says the following, I wasn't aware of Ricardo's work regarding the reciprocating, reciprocating assembly. I do know of his vast research in finding in cylinder heads, primarily combustion chambers and turbulence. This will become important. Again, this is somebody else who's like read Ricardo's work, but is unfamiliar with this Ricardo rule. So in that exact same thread, we've got a guy here, ALB, and ALB is trying to learn a few things. Lionheart, do you have a link for the Ricardo rule? I looked through 20 pages of Google results and didn't find anything. Even Googled Sir, Googled Sir Henry Ricardo and couldn't find any of his writings that way either. It, somebody else out there, not just me, is trying to find this stuff. It's pretty darn good. And it turns out that the guy who posted the original piece, that piece right there, he disappeared from the conversation and never got back to it. Okay, we've got a very famous VW person here. This happens to be Jake Raby. The rods are too short and give an astounding rod ratio when used with stroker cranks. This is not good for engine life as the rod angle is very steep and puts a lot of wear. The bigger the bore, the worse this becomes on the piston skirts side loading. The Ricardo rule states that a 175 to one rod ratio is optimum for most engine applications. Okay, let's throw a little shop talk form in here. The rod angle does affect the clock position at which the piston rod has its most leverage on the crank. The shorter the rod, the closer to 130. The longer the rod, the closer to 3 o'clock. And it's going to be interesting to actually look at the diagrams and see how much variance there is. All right, since I've been doing so much stuff on the flying forms, let's throw a little flying form in here as well. It's interesting to see what Bob Hoover used to say about the subject in VWs, warning that going below the optimum Ricardo ratio is very bad for the VW in terms of wear and sidewall loading. Uh, we come back over here to another Hoover thing. This is not in his blog. This is one of the things that he wrote. Uh, Ricardo was a 1930s British automotive engineer who literally wrote the book on what we now modern engines. 1930s British automotive engineer, so we know who the guy is, and he literally wrote the book. So what Hoover is telling you to go find is in fact a book. Uh, in general, if I'm trying to tell you some factual piece of stuff, I try and go to the actual factual type stuff. Well, it turns out the book that Bob Hoover is talking about is this particular book, The High Speed Internal Combustion Engine. This is by Harry Ricardo, not Henry Ricardo. And let's drop down here. It was uh, 1941. Well, it turns out that this book has some really good stuff at the back end of it. So here's the index. Every single thing that's in there is contained within this index, which means if you've got something along the lines of a rod ratio, a rod to stroke ratio, cylinder wall loading, anything related to that, it's going to be in here. Okay, see this piece right here? Connecting rod design. You know, if you've got a rule, where are you going to put it? You're going to put it where it's tied to what the component is. Well, it's a connecting rod, so what do we want to do? 
we want a rod ratio relative to our stroke. Well, that's kind of a design parameter for the connecting rod. So where's it going to be? Connecting rod design. Okay, here we are. Connecting rods. The chief considerations in the design of a connecting rod are, one, that it shall be stiff enough to resist not only bending and crushing, but also vibration. Two, that it shall be as light as possible. And three, that the big end of the rod shall be sufficiently rigid to ensure adequate support of the bearing. And that is it. As it turns out, there is in fact no Ricardo rule, which means Okay, this is my cousin Paul. Paul, I'm not sure how old that photo is. Paul's about 64 years old now, I think, something like that. Anyway, he's the manager of CRF's engine combustion department, which focuses on building the science base needed by industry to develop new generations of high-efficiency clean engines. Uh, let me see, what else has he got here? He's a fellow of the SAE International. He's got other things, honors, awards, whatnot. Anyway, well, anyway, this is my cousin. I sent him an email. Let's see if we can pop that email up. Okay, so anyway, this is what my cousin Paul said. Yeah, Harry Ricardo was uber famous. He started a consulting company, blah, blah. This is over in Great Britain. He uh, was big behind clarifying some of the first steps for reducing knock. Okay, that means he's not necessarily a rod ratio guy. I have previously spent some time looking at stroke and bore ratios. That's not rod ratio. It's something else, which is nice because once I perhaps some point in the future get to the point where I want to go to stroke, broken bore ratios, I might, uh, I've got somebody I can chat with. Anyway, trying to understand how that impacts efficiency, but I've never looked at rod and stroke ratio, though it obviously shows up in the kinematics and piston motion. He's correct there. I took a quick look at Haywood's book to see what he says. Nothing. I'm not sure who Haywood is, but if, hey, if my cousin says it's a, it's a good book, yeah, I would imagine it's a good book. Googling turns up the Ricardo rule, but I have a low trust level in a lot of the material I saw. Well, join the crowd, Paul. I do think it's likely mainly a trade-off between friction losses slash slide forces and engine packaging considerations. Lastly, the SAE database returns one hit on Ricardo rule, but I didn't see anything in the paper related to connecting rod length. Not very helpful, sorry. And I did email my cousin back and I said, no, no, that was extremely helpful in the fact that uh, he basically confirmed everything that I found. There is in fact no Ricardo rule. Reason. Look, my, my, my cousin's been doing this for decades, and uh, if it's something that he hasn't investigated, then it's probably not particularly important. Obviously, I mean, I just read you what Ricardo thought. Ricardo didn't think it was particularly important. So this is something that seems to be a figment of Hoover's imagination. Uh, if it came from somewhere, it came from some non-reputable source, and Hoover must have, somehow or another, he just either got confused or he deliberately said, you know what? I can enhance this thing by throwing somebody else's name on it. Who the heck knows? The guy's gone. I'd love to know. Bob, where did you get this from? I'd love to see the original source. Because based on my knowledge of the mathematics, there's no way that this rod ratio thing could possibly exist. Anybody who understands the math would know it's not going to make that big a difference. So let's take a look at uh, the it's not going to take much of a make much of a difference piece right now a modeling of a piece of an actual engine and okay this is fairly straightforward what are you looking at right here well these circles represent cranks i've got here a stock crank and i've got here a stock crank but i've got enough sliders and stuff to be able to you know manipulate things uh, i'd like to keep things relative to stock but uh, it's sometimes it's nice to be able to play with two of them at once so we can do a little bit of that these numbers right here represent the actual rod ratio. Uh, the stock rod ratio is, some of you may know, is close to two to one. So let's take a look now at how well I have modeled the motion of the crank rotating around and the rod following along. So this is going to be up here. This is going to be the wrist pin. Down here, this is going to be the crank pin. I'm going to take the crank pin and rotate it around. Okay, this represents the angle that I'm sweeping it through. I'm going to sweep it through 360 degrees. Okay, and then we're going to sweep it back 360 degrees. I can also play that and have that automated so it's all super smooth. Look at that. Isn't that nice? Okay, do you see anything that's weird? No, that's because the math is correct. I want you to look at something about right there. Do you see the gap between these two right here? Okay, this represents where the crank pin is because there's an angle. If this came across like this and I had a straight up rod, that tells you where the rod would be if there was no angle.
So look at it again so that you can see how far off it goes. It's not terrible. So the first thing we want to do is look at the motion that's happening up here at the wrist pin. And there's going to be a couple other little things too, but we're mostly interested in what's happening up here. I mean, this is all about essentially motion of the piston and lateral force. So let's take a look at what's going on with basically the motion that's happening up here at the wrist pin. So we turn on the wrist pin. All right, we get some curves. All right, this particular curve right here represents the motion of the wrist pin, the physical, the deliberate, you know, as it goes up and down, the motion. Right. This one here represents the velocity as it goes down the bore. Obviously, top dead center, you're not going to have any velocity. At some point past, you hit peak velocity, and then you begin to drop. And then you go back to zero. And this here represents the acceleration. And remember now, this is a stock system. Now, the idea is, is that we don't want to screw around with our rod ratios very much, right? So, uh, if... You know, Bob Hoover's thesis that these horrible things are going to happen, we should be able to see some pretty serious changes to these curves as you change the rod ratio around. So let's start with this stock to stock comparison. This is going to be stock. This one on the left, I never change the rod ratio, the rod on this one right here. This is always going to be the stock 5 4 rod. I can play around with the rod on this side right here. So let's play around with the rod on this side and see what happens. First of all, we're going to make it shorter. Which is going to be the horrible thing. You know, like, let's make it shorter and really drive up our lateral friction, our sidewall friction. So I make it a little bit shorter. And you can see that if I put a shorter rod in, I have pulled the piston down the bore. But do you really see anything significant in the velocity? You can see a tiny, tiny difference. But this is uh, another thing to see is that notice that these things are set up at 100. And 100, this is 100%. So that you can do kind of a percentage comparison. Just kind of eyeball it to see whether or not you've made a significant difference. So we go back to stock and then down. Stock, down. Okay, now let's go to the longer run. So you see some differences. Obviously, it's going to stick out the bore more. And there are some subtle differences. The velocity of the piston doesn't change that much. Uh, accelerations can change, but that's... The, the accelerations involve vibration. It's not going to really impact too much other stuff. Uh, as far as this analysis goes, it's mostly going to be uh, the shape of these curves up here and uh, the velocity. Look at those first two. But uh, let's take a look. Let's say at, uh, we want to do a stock rod. And let's figure out where the point of peak velocity occurs. So let's take our slider and find peak velocity. All right, peak velocity, somewhere around 70, maybe a little bit less, eh, 68, somewhere around there. All right, let's take the second stroke. Let's do this one right here, and let's run it up. For instance, I run a 1745, right? So that's got a 76 stroke. Let's compare stocker, stock stroke to 76. Now you get some differences. The problem is you can't get away from making these differences. And let me show you that you can't get away from them by moving the rod around a little bit. Let me take the rod for the green one and push it around a little bit. That's not significant. Do you see anything happening with the velocity, the accelerations? Not a whole lot. Let's make the rod longer. No major changes. Nothing horrible. Let's take, uh, let's say, let's push it up a little bit further. Let's go to, let's say, an 82. Okay, everybody loves the 2180. So take a look at the difference visually between a 69 and an 82 stroke with a stock rod. Okay, and then your curves. All right, let's go ahead and play with our rod ratios with that long stroke. Okay, make it short. Make the rod short. Not a huge difference. Make the rod, rod longer. Not a huge difference. All right, let's compare them directly now, because I did tell you that I could take this stroke on this side and I could push it up. So let's take both curves and bring them up. All right, I've got two 82 motors. Notice that all the curves are directly overlapping now. Let's go to a shorter rod. Oh, the horror. Oh, my God. Jeez, I'm just, just going to destroy my motor by going with a shorter rod. Okay, let's go to a longer rod. Oh, my God. 5.7. I don't even know if you can get 5.7s for, you know, on a cheap. I think you can get 5.6s on a cheap. But uh, 
you know, Bob Hoover says you can get five seven, so I thought I'd throw him in there. Anyway, that's a five six. Here's a five five, which is one of the rods that I'm planning on using when I should I ever get around to building uh, the motor for my seventy four. But just real quick, let's see if I can. Uh, well, I can't animate this one, but let's take a look. Again, not much difference. Not much difference. And again, the one you need to be looking at is not necessarily the acceleration. You want to pay attention to the velocity curve. That's more important. Not much happening. I can stretch. I can shorten that rod ratio out. Or I can lengthen that rod ratio. But it doesn't make a lot of difference. Okay, it's a four-stroke motor, right? So what am I looking at right here? This happens to be four strokes. I compress my fuel, I spark the ignition, I build pressure, I then extract work from it coming down, my exhaust valve opens, we hit the bottom, and then we push out the exhaust. I then suck in my air and repeat. This particular piece of the curve, this piece up here, represents the piston force. Okay, now this happens to be bars as in pressure, but if you take the pressure and you multiply it by the area of a piston, you get a force. So what I need to be able to do is model this particular force, because ultimately we want to look at what is the actual side load. i got a piston going up and down, but what is my side load? Well, I need to know what my downward load is first in order for me to figure out what my side load is. So let's see how well I have built up the curve. Okay, you see this little black dot, gray dot, whatever right there? Okay, that can be controlled by this particular slider right here. I can pull this back to top, dead center. We can go over peak, we come down, we push down through the middle of this cycle, and we get the exhaust valve open. This particular curve has been pretty well modeled. Now let's go back and take a look at an actual engine. Okay, this is the focus of what we're trying to do, which is lateral force. Now remember, I told you the lateral force came from that diagram right there. I took that formula and just simply brought it over to this particular graph. It is represented by the blue line that goes down right there. So let's see if I've actually got my dot following the blue line. Let's follow the blue line along, yes. It follows the blue line pretty stinking well. That's good. All right, so what else are we looking at here? All right, you see this dotted line? Well, as the rod goes through its motion, there's more force in the rod than there is force going down through the piston based on this angle. So you have to take the force and multiply it essentially by a trigonometric function that gives you the increased force down the rod. Well, that increased force is represented by the blue line. Uh, I should be able to alter that. Uh, sorry, the, it's, it's indicated by the, the dotted line. Let me see if I can move it slightly. Yeah, it doesn't move a whole heck of a lot. And that's the important thing. This is why nobody really focuses on rod ratio. You know, as far as lateral load goes, right, this is the like the worst crank you could stick in here. Let's get let's let's actually shove it to the worst possible crank. The 84. All right, uh, you're pretty much in a stock case. You can't really go past an 84, right? So you build the old 2332. You stick your 94 by 84. Well, this is the lateral load diagram that you're going to get on something like this. And this is the shortest possible rod you could put on it. And then you go to stock, 5.5, five, five, 5.6, and 5.7. Saying, well, well, there's not much going on here. I mean, it's just, it's kind of a non-issue. Once you've decided to go with an 84 crank, you're kind of stuck. This is what you've got. Shorten the rod, nothing much happens. This represents the rod angle right here, by the way. A peak rod angle is going to be at 90 degrees. Let's push it to 90 degrees. Go back. 90. Hey, there it is. 90 degrees. Okay, so 90 degrees, you hit peak angle. Uh, if you read that off, looks like peak angle is somewhere around, what, 17 degrees? So that's with a short rod. Let's take a look at the longer rod. Okay, that's it. You're stuck. Short rod, long rod. Doesn't really make that much difference. Okay, assuming these are percentages, this is 100%, which means this will be a stock motor. This is relative to stock. I'm going to look at this real quick in just a second. 
this is actually kind of fictitious. All right, let's see. One of the things that you may be saying that I've missed out on is what about the dynamic loading? All right, there's a lot of things going on in dynamic loading. I'd have to include in this particular diagram uh, the RPMs. Okay, I could do that. I'd have to also throw on the mass of a piston, which are a whole bunch of different sizes. Uh, I'd have to factor in uh, the fractional portion of the mass of the connecting rod. The different connecting rods have different masses. To actually take the dynamic loads and throw them on top of this would take an awful lot of work. I just decided I didn't want to do that. Uh, as a general rule, the dynamic loads will reduce the curve, the side loading in this area. And as a general rule, they will increase the dynamic loads in this area. But in the area of peak, there's very little change in the dynamic loads because you're not accelerating the piston. Let's see if I can throw that up here. Okay, this represents the acceleration. At this point right here, let me see if I can bring 66. Perfect. It looks like it hits like peak, or it, rather it hits negative, sorry, zero acceleration at about 66 degrees, which uh, up in this area, which means you're not going to have much dynamic loading around this particular point. The peak of the curve is where the peak of the curve is going to be, whether you've included dynamic load or not. We need to look at another little teeny tiny piece because a lot of people are going to tell you, oh, this lateral load is so big, it's going to wear your motor out. Okay, let's, we got to go take a look at it. We're going to have to do a little tiny bit on the whiteboard. Let's see if we can't do that now. Okay, so here we are at the whiteboard. And what I want to set up is two motors that are roughly similar displacement. So this is an 85 5 by 82 for 1883 cc's. And this is a 94 by 69 for 1915 cc's. Now, since their displacements are pretty close, they're going to be doing about the same amount of work. So let's just assume that they do do the same amount of work. So what is work? So that's just basic physics. It's a force applied over distance, and in a formulaic formula it would look something like this. Work equal force times distance. The force is from the piston, so the pistons push down. I got a smaller piston, I got a bigger piston. Clearly the small piston won't push down as hard as the big piston, which means a small piston over a big stroke produces a particular torque, and a big piston over a small stroke is going to produce the same torque. Thus, you get the same amount of work. So we set these two formulas up, force distance, force distance, and they're the same. Now what do I know? I know that the distance that the piston falls is going to be proportional to the stroke, 82 and 69. When I'm looking at these two F's, F's here, I got an F1 and an F2, and I'm like, well, you know what? Let's just assume, let's say, that that one is just an arbitrary unit force. So this F2 disappears from the formula, and I want to solve for the F1. So I take 69 and divide it by 82, and that gives us the F1. And when we actually do the math, that means that the force on piston 1, this guy here, is 84.1% of a force that is applied to that 94 piston. And I'm going to take this value, and I'm going to take it upstairs to the graph, and see what happens. Here's our graph. On the left, of course, we have the... 69 millimeter stroke, which we're going to assume is attached up here to a 94 millimeter piston. And over here we have the 82 stroke, which is going to be attached to an 85.5 piston up there. Now, as far as the general curves go, uh, this thing assumes that they're attached to the same piston. Pistons, similar pistons, similar forces. But what I get to do with this particular graph, I'm going to take this curve and I'm going to use that ratio that we came up with uh, down on the, on the whiteboard. So we pop into the lateral force formulas. I know that my green curve is this one right here. It was multiplied by 0.841. There we go. Now we're comparing an apple to an apple instead of an apple to an orange. You can see down here that we do, in fact, have alternate ratios. I mean, the rod stuff is clearly going to be bigger when you go to the bigger stroke, so that's covered. But look at the lateral forces. Lateral forces are pretty much overlaid. Let's take the lateral force and put it into the vicinity of peak. 57, 58, perfect. Okay, here's the dot. I didn't change the dot, but that's where the unnormalized force would be. And I can actually see a teeny tiny bit of difference in there. Zoom in. Down in these areas, you can see that there are subtle differences in the amount of force being passed through the rod. The green one's going to have the higher one. It's got the higher uh, rod angle. The green one with the higher rod angle, it's ever so slightly higher than this. 
let's go ahead and play with the rod angle. So I can bring the rod angle of the stroker down. It should get worse. It did it. It got worse. This is stock, and I should be able to make it get better. So look at that. Okay. Don't just look at this curve right here. Look at the green curve down in here as well. Okay, we can push the green curve pretty darn close back to that. All right, let's go ahead and increase it. Ratio to 5.3. That looks like that's about 102. It's about 2% worse when you go to the shorter rod, the 5.3 rod. And it should be about 2% better. And then 4%. And then about 6. Eh, okay. It's close to linear, but not quite. I mean, these are all trigonometric functions that are... You nest them together and they end up being occasionally close to linear over small angles. So that's what you get. Okay, so there you go. Once you've normalized to two motors that have the same displacement, big piston, little piston, and you compare the graphs, the lateral load for the two motors doesn't really differ by that much, even though the strokes are off by this is really tiny and this is about as big as you can throw inside the case. Doesn't make any difference. Build it. Just once you pick out what size motor you want, this happens to be a 1.9. If you like a 1.8 or a 2 liter, if you're in the ballpark, you know, plus or minus 1 or 2%, they're going to produce exactly the same lateral loads. It's just the way that it works. So back to the graph, let's take a look real quick at something that's really, really interesting here that you may not have picked up on when we looked at it earlier. Based on those ratios, we were able to take these peak uh, lateral forces and uh, reduce the green one, this guy over here, even though he's got the worst rod angle, look at the angle there, he's got a worse rod angle. Uh, with a 5.5 rod, I've been able to reduce it down below the baseline engine with the 69 stroke. So we were pretty close, but slightly above. Now we're below, so this is a 5.5. This rod to stroke ratio is almost two to one. This one is 1.7, roughly. This 1.7 violates Hoover's Ricardo rule, which means you're into the area where you're going to blow up your motor, basically. And yet, when we do the analysis, it shows that this particular motor over here, the green one, actually has smaller lateral loads on it than the similar one with the 69 stroke. It makes you wonder, how in the world could there possibly have been this Ricardo rule? Because what we're looking at here is something that violates the Ricardo rule. You see, the thing is, Ricardo was a pretty smart guy. And that, I believe, is why, right here, you're looking at it right there, is why the Ricardo rule is, in fact, a figment of someone's imagination. I don't think it was Hoover's. You know how mechanics are. Mechanics just talk. Somebody starts it, and they just repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. And eventually, it's like, that's how it works. Only it isn't how it works. So it's not in Ricardo's book. Um, go back. My cousin mentioned this guy named Haywood. So this is Haywood. Notice that he's at MIT. Okay, he's not a mechanic. He's an MIT guy. And let's take a look at the book. This is the second book, second edition, Internal Combustion Engine Fundamentals. Anyway, this is the book that my cousin was looking at. So this is two very high-end engineers who have written books, one back in the 1920s. And this guy here, he put his book together. This is like an updated version of stuff that he did in the 60s and 70s. But at MIT, he kept working, so he kept adding and adding and adding. So this is a very uh, more up-to-date. I'm not sure what the published date is, it, but he kept going at it for about 30 years. So I'd imagine this is probably from somewhere around 2010. This is, I, I, I look at this and I just go, this is absolutely glorious. This is proof right here. What you're looking at right there on the screen is proof that this Ricardo rule, in fact, does not exist. So there you go, everybody. That's pretty much it for that particular topic. Uh, let's do a little summary here. First of all, the rod. Take the rod that fits whatever it is you're going to build and makes it work. The rod length won't really matter that much. You saw the graphs. It's not going to make a big difference. Two, the Ricardo rule is, in fact, not actually a rule. It is a figment of somebody's imagination. I'm being nice there, okay? But if I was Harry Ricardo, the guy you see on the screen there, I would be very upset that somebody had uh, thrown my name against that particular rule. I don't like it when people try and take advantage of 
your inability to understand stuff. It's like I, I kind of figure it's my job to make sure that you are presented with the proper arguments to either prove or disprove something. Hopefully you got something out of it. Uh, it was interesting. It took me about, I swear, this is about a month and a half to put this one together. All right, we'll see you on the next one.